Question 11. Company A is launching a new product with a large marketing campaign that will cost $2 million. To finance the project, the CEO has received the following information from the finance department. So we've got our uh, required ROE, which will be our cost of equity um, or the discount rate. Before tax required uh, on debt is 9% and then the tax bracket is 35%. So we'll use this to compute cost of debt if we need to. If the CEO decides to sell $25 million in new debt and issue $14 million in common stock, the marginal weighted average cost of capital should be closest to. So our weighted average cost of capital, or WAC, is going to be equity weight times cost of equity. So we're given our cost of equity of 21%. And then we'll figure out our equity rate, uh, equity weight by um, looking at the amount we're issuing in common stock and the amount we're issuing in debt to figure out that weight. And then the debt weight will be one minus the equity weight. And cost of debt, like we said, is going to be that before tax required, and then we'll multiply it by the tax rate to get the after tax cost. So to get those weights, we're, for equity, we're going to be taking 14, which is the new issue, and then divide that by the 14 plus 25, which is the total amount of capital we need, um, gives us 0.359, and then the inverse of that should be the debt, which works out to 0.641. So bring it all together then, we've got our 0.359 equity weight times the 21% uh, ROE, or required return on equity. Um, and then take the debt weight times 9 times the 1 minus the tax rate. It gives us a weighted average cost of capital of 11.2889. Uh, we can go ahead and round that up to a 11.3%. Question 12. An analyst calculates that shares of ABC are trading at a lower price than their intrinsic value. This analyst would most likely conclude that ABC is A, overvalued, B, fairly valued, or C, overvalued. So it's trading at a lower price than its intrinsic value. So let's say the stock is trading at $10, but we think it's worth $15. So this is going to um, indicate that we think the stock can go up $5. The market is assigning it a value of $10. We're assigning it a value of $15. So in this case, we would say the stock is undervalued. So we will go with C. And I think one thing just to note or point out is that... Um, the, the analyst calculating this, this is not an objective calculation. There's a lot of assumptions that go into this. So this is really their opinion that the intrinsic value is greater than the um, is greater than the price. Another analyst might think that this $10 stock is only worth $5, and they would say that it's overvalued. But in this case, they think the intrinsic value is higher than the stock price, so the stock is overvalued in their eyes. Question 13. Collin Company's next year EPS estimate is 2.5 per share. The return on equity is 10%. If the company's dividend payout ratio is 60% and the investor's required rate of return is 9%, then the intrinsic value of Collin Company is closest to. So we're going to be um, looking to calculate a forward PE multiple, which is price, oh, price per share over earnings, which is going to be price uh, over earnings. So if we can multiply the EPS over the uh, PE multiple, that's going to give us the share price. So the PE multiple is essentially giving you um, the price per $1 of earnings. Um, so multiplying that by the 2.5 will give us our intrinsic value. So we've got uh, 4 PE equals the dividend payout ratio, which we're given at 60%. And then we've got R minus G so our R value is going to be that required rate of return uh, by investors. And G is going to be growth, which we are not given. So then to calculate the growth, um, we do have all the information we need here. So growth is going to be 1 minus that dividend payout ratio of 60% or 0.6. And multiply that by the ROE, which is our uh, 10%. So now we have G of 0.04. Our R will be that 0.09 and then dividend payout ratio of 0.6. So now we have all the information we need. It we need, um, so we can plug that in to get our forward PE multiple, which ends up at 12. Share price equals P 
PE times EPS, which gives us 12 times that 2.5 EPS estimate, um, which is $30 or 30 uh, pounds. So we will go with A, 30. Question 14. A company has recently announced an annual dividend on its stock of 0.78. Analysts believe the dividends are expected to grow at an annual rate of 4% for five years and then 2% thereafter. If the required rate of return on equity is 8%, then the intrinsic value of the share of stock is closest to. So we can solve this problem using our cash flows function on the calculator since we're getting a stream of dividends. Um, so we're going to basically be um, discounting all of these annual dividends back to the present value along with the um, terminal value of the stock in period five once the uh, growth rate um, levels off to 2%. So basically for our inputs to the calculator we're going to be these are going to be our cash flow periods so our cash flow in period one is going to be um, that 0.78 multiplied by 4%, which is going to give us 0.8112. And then we're multiplying by uh, 1.04 again, which is that um, annual growth rate, and then so on down the line in, to period five. And so these will be the first inputs that we're putting in to that cash flows calculator, the cash flows function on the calculator. The only, so then for period five, we're going to have this dividend but then we also need to add in the terminal value um, of the stock. And so to find the terminal value, we're going to be using our Gordon growth model. So recall the Gordon growth model is going to be that dividend in period zero. And so this is where it gets a little tricky because our period zero dividend is actually going to be our period five dividend. And that's what we're using because um, at, after the five years, that's when our we're assuming 2% uh, growth in perpetuity. perpetuity. So we're going to be taking that last um, n value, uh, multiplying it by the growth rate to get the year 6 dividend, um, and then taking the uh, return on equity of 8%, which is the discount rate, subtracting out the growth rate. So we get 16.13283 as our terminal value. And so we're going to be taking all these dividends, um, and then in period five, we'll do this dividend plus the terminal value, discounting that back by the return on equity of 8% to get our answer. So I'm going to pull up the calculator now so we can walk through that. I've already got all the numbers punched in, but we'll just um, take a look here. So we've got our 0.8112 as cash flow one corresponding there, uh, 0.8436, 0.8774. 0.9125, and then here's where we have the terminal value added. So we've got the um, 0.94899 plus 16.13, which gives us 17.0818. And then from here, make sure there's no, no other stray cash flows in there. We'll go to our present value NPV calculation. Uh, we've got the discount rate of 8%. We'll scroll down, compute and we get 14.46%. Um, there's probably just some differences in rounding there, so we can uh, pretty confidently go with 14.49, answer C. Question 15, a price weighted index is composed of four stocks. Stock A trades at $21, stock B at uh, $142, stock C at $34, and stock D at $602. One year later, stock A is now worth 24, stock B is at 210, stock C is at 12, and stock D is at 610. The total return for this index is closest to. So the key here is that our index is price weighted. Um, so we're not gonna be having to rebalance at all. So the beginning and ending weights are going to be less relevant. So essentially our stocks are just weighted based on the price. So what you do for this is you just add up all the stocks at the beginning. So you're gonna add up the 602 plus 34 plus 21 plus 142, and that's gonna be your beginning um, value. And then you add up the ending value as 24 plus 210 plus 12 plus 610, since this is what they've appreciated to. And then you're really just doing your normal um, 
price return calculation. So we've got our ending value, which is going to be 856, which is all those um, one year later numbers added together, minus the beginning value, which is going to be the um, what we started at uh, over beginning, gives us 0 0.0713 or 7.13%. Answer C. Question 16. A finance student wants to create an index with the stock he bought in a paper trading account. The notes from his record show the following. Initial price, uh, stock A is $10, stock B is 15. Current price, stock A is 5 or 15, and stock B is 30. Assuming an initial index value of 105, the equal weighted index value for the two stocks is now closest to so what we need to do is find the weighted average return of these two stocks. So the and we got equal weighted, or they they said we're equal weighting it. So we'll be 50% in stock A, 50% in stock B, um, and then what's the return of those uh, over these initial and current price periods? We're going to take that return, multiply it by the index value of 105. So our returns is going to be relatively straightforward. So our 15 over 10 minus 1 gives us a 50% return on stock A, and then B doubled in price, so we've got a 100% return there. Um, so I did it as just a weighted average return calculation, or but you could have just um, taken the difference of the, or not the difference, um, the uh, midpoint of these, or add them together and divide by 2, since it's a equal weight. So I got weighted average return of 0.75. So our return is 0.75, so we do that 105 initial value times 1 plus 0.75 gives us 183.75. So this is what our new index value is. Answer C. Question 17. Which of the following is not an assumption of the Gordon growth model? A, the growth rate of the dividend is increasing. So right off the bat, this is actually going to be our answer. The uh, assumption of the Gordon growth model is that the dividend rate is constant. And so we can take a look at B and C here, but we'll, uh, we're probably going to go with A. And if we were using an increase in dividend rate, we'd have to use some type of multi-stage dividend model, um, not the Gordon model. B, dividends are appropriate measures of shareholders' wealth. This is an assumption of the Gordon growth model. And then C, the return on the stock is greater than the constant dividend growth rate. That is also an assumption. And let's just pull in the formula here with some simple numbers to kind of show why for answer C. So for answer C, the return on the stock is greater than the constant dividend growth rate. Um, it actually gives us that there, constant dividend growth rate, whereas here we've got increasing. But anyway, so our Gordon growth model is going to be that next period dividend, D1, I just plugged in 2, and then we've got R as our return, or our the return on the stock, and then G as our growth rate. We can see if we have R less than G, we end up with a negative number for our intrinsic value, um, which we know a stock can't be worth negative value. Um, so that's why that's an assumption. So we will go with A. Growth rate of the dividend is increasing, not an assumption. Question 18. An investor buys 150 shares of a stock on margin at 178 per share using an initial leverage ratio of 1 over 2. At what stock price will he receive a margin call if the maintenance margin requirement for the position is 20%? So let's pull in our formulas and answer here. Um, so the maintenance margin uh, requirement formula is actually going to be right here so it's going to be um, we're given that of 0.2 so we're going to be using this though to solve for P which is going to be our um, margin call price and so we're going to have 89 our initial equity per share which is going to take that leverage ratio into account uh, multiplied by the original share price so we've got our leverage ratio of 1 over 2 which is 0.5 and that share price of 178 and then we're going to add that to the um, margin call price which we're solving for and then we'll subtract out the actual share price of or the full share price of 178 and then divide that by P as well so basically we take this um, do the algebra out gives us P equals 
111.25, which is going to be our answer B. Question 19. An investor can achieve positive risk-adjusted returns on average by using the fundamental analysis trading strategy in which of the following forms of market efficiency? A. Weak form efficiency only. So yes, this is going to be possible in weak form efficiency since uh, weak form efficiency is only assuming past information is priced in, not necessarily all current public and future information. Um, so this will be a possible answer. It does say only though, so we'll, let's take a look at the other answers here. Strong form efficiency only. Strong form efficiency assuming, is assuming that all past and public information is priced in. So we're, it's likely not gonna be um, possible to consistently outperform. Uh, so we can go ahead and cross out B. C, we've got weak, which we've established is good, and semi-strong form efficiency only. So semi-strong is going to be, um, sorry, I actually messed that up. So strong form efficiency is going to assume all public, past, and private information. So this strong form is assuming every all available information is priced in. Semi-strong is not going to assume private information, but it will assume um, public information currently and then also past information. So semi-strong um, will also be difficult to outperform due to that. Um, so we will stick with A, just weak form efficiency. And I'm just going to pull that table in from the answer online um, that gives a good summary of where abnormal returns is um, possible. And we see there for fundamental analysis, possible yes on weak and semi-strong, but not strong. So we will stick with A, weak form efficiency only. Question 20. A company plans to invest $14.3 million in a project which is expected to generate $3.7 million per year in each of the next seven years. The company's opportunity cost of capital is 8%. The project's MPV is closest to. So we can uh, just use the cash flows function on the calculator for this. I've already got the numbers plugged in, but we'll walk through it. So our cash flow at period zero is going to be that initial investment of $14.3 million. Uh, 14 .3 million. It's going to be a negative number. Um, we will then receive 3.7 million per year, which would be, I put in cash flow one, and then you can just put a frequency of seven since it's that same cash flow for the next uh, seven years. Uh, make sure we don't have any stray cash flows in there from previous problems, which we don't. So now we can go to NPV, put in eight as our discount rate, and then we'll go down and compute. We get 4.9. 63 million and some change and we see that corresponds right here to answer B.